The views and opinions expressed on From the Mouths of Madness are that of the panel and not of the Geeks Under the Influence Network or their sponsors. Amazon.com and TeePublic.com. Listeners, beware. Coming straight from the mouths of madness. I am one of the hosts, Lowdown. With me, as always, is F. U. Hunter. What's up, bitches? You adapting <laughs> bitches. I don't adapting to the stories from the set of books. Bitches, Thing, bitches. Yeah, that was terrible. We're sorry. Not really. Uh, <laughs> tonight we got a special one for you. As you know, it is September, and September is Stephen King month. Now, by that I mean we at least get one episode in on King because there's so much other shit to cover. And moving forward, we're going to take some of his short story, his collections, and we'll just go in chronological order and talk about each one and what stories were adapted into film. So that means for tonight, we're going to be talking about Night Shift, which in my opinion is his best. And I don't know if the man, uh, Hunter here, has read a lot of it. Nah, none know, of it. But I know nah. the man who has, <laughs> and back for our, 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 he's our king regular, we've got Mike Reiser. Hey everybody, how's it going? Yeah, he's always excited to me to talk about King, good or bad. Because there's <laughs> some bad. Let me tell you. Yeah, a, a catalog that huge, you're gonna have some misfires, and he does even in this collection of stories. Yeah, and but this, at least with this one, his excuse is like, I was young, I was a new writer. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what that's what I would roll with. <laughs> Shit. So like, nine out of these twenty short stories that were in Night Shift were printed. Between seven, 1970 and 1975, while he was in college, right out of high school, between when he was in college, uh, and pu- published in a magazine called Cavalier. And then the rest were published in between Cosmopolitan. Uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Beauty Tips and Murder. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, sure. And then uh, also Penthouse. So yeah. there's, yeah. I didn't realize there was any... Thing to read in Penthouse. That so. speaks volumes, Hunter. I yeah, understand I a lot about you now. Boobies. Well, you're also not much of a reader. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, not to be negative. I'm just saying, like, there are people that aren't readers. Like. Uh, yeah, and I get easily distracted. So yeah, <laughs> put, re- put, reading put, a book put, is hard to do. Putting short stories in penthouse, <laughs> I might not make it to the short story part of that magazine. <laughs> and this is something that like people in the modern world can't even conceptualize. But back in the day, respected men and women of letters published in penthouse and Playboy left and right. Yeah, it's, it was a it's mark it's of true. prestige. It's true. I know. I remember though. I did have to seek out. Uh, years ago, a a penthouse because somehow I don't know how this happened. Robert Kirkman had released just like seven pages that explain Negan's origin. What? And released it. What? In penthouse Whoa. of all places, <laughs> black and white, Walking Dead, like same artist. And I was like, I now have to intentionally seek out this I one. How much that's worth? And you know who's on the cover of that one? Who? Fucking. Bruno Mars, of all people. I'm like, so I'm looking for a penthouse with Bruno Mars <laughs> that has Walking Dead in it. Yeah. It's a whole, that's that's a whole know. thing. That's a whole thing right there. That's a whole life-altering I could have been patient. The fuck? They reprinted it in one of the trades later on, but I had to have it. So I bet that penthouse, is, you still have it? Oh, yeah. Have you checked the value of it? No. Because like cover price, the thing for a penthouse Playboy is what, 25 20 something like that? I haven't checked in years. They used to be like 7 bucks. Yeah, I think I paid 10 bucks for it. pretty sure they're not that cheap anymore. Yeah, I'll have to go into find out what the collectability is of that penthouse of Bruno Mars in the front and Negan's origin. But it's all middle. about the Negan. Some some hardcore collectors like I gotta have the original printing of Negan's yeah, origin story. How random is that shit? So yeah, there's yeah that was I did seek it out for not the titties. So uh, yeah. uh, fair fair enough. I mean I, I still look at the titties. So I, some, I, I, I bought it. I bought a penthouse. So yeah, I mean there's more than after I was done with the Walking Dead. I said, well let me scope Bruno out the rest Mars of titties. It. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me learn more about Bruno Mars. Ooh. <laughs> See, it was only half joke that people read it for the articles. Yeah. <laughs> the more you know, motherfuckers, get your read on. There's no excuse not to read. You got comics, you got boobies, you still got reading. It's all in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, there's it's a full education. It's a full education <laughs> system. Anyway, the only um, f- books that weren't published elsewhere, excuse me, stories, was the first one, which we could all could fucking do without. It's called Jerusalem's Lot. And again, we were talking about this before the episode. If he had not released Salem's Lot prior to this book, it would have held. It would have actually held on its own. 
Um, Roger, you can speak to the writing style of that. Yeah, the writing style is pretty good. It's like Dracula. It's an epistolary story told entirely in letters about the supernatural in New England. So sort of Lovecraftian roots as well. And so in, in my mind, the way the story unfolds, especially through the letters, because it, it's a short story. So it's like rapid pace, slow descent into madness. They go uncover things in the town. It was well written. It's just don't give me a story, a whole fucking novel about fucking vampires. And they give you some fucking shit about a worm and some evil priest who has an inbred town. Like, Yeah, it would be like buying a Mortal Kombat game and it was just full of cars that race each other. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> so that's really where it fell flat. It, it, like again, you, you, dude, what do you... Stop. Stop. Uh. I'm also of the opinion that the stand tie-in uh, Night Surf falls just as flat because it's about a group of people dying of the plague. We saw plenty of that in the stand, and it was incredibly well executed, and this is clumsy and not well executed, and it doesn't tie into the larger world. And I th Well, I think, um, so I think the big thing is that that was like his precursor to the stand. Because uh -huh. I, don't, I don't think he had started writing the stand. He might have started writing the stand, uh, but when the stand came out in what, late, mid-80s? Right, mid eighties. This the night shift yeah, came out so. in seventy eight. So maybe that was like his jump off of a, like a disease. Thing. Yeah, kind of test in the waters. Yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, literally. <laughs> so from that perspective, I get. I I I did reread that, and yes, it is dull in comparison. But that makes a little more sense, you know, if he's like using that as a jumping off point. Um, the other one that is really good that was written strictly strictly for night shift was last one on the ladder. Uh, so good, but so so fucking sad. So fucking sad. <laughs> it's almost like in the in the remake of it with part two, where you know they changed the ending where um uh what's his face? Uh wrote the letter to all them to be mailed out right before he like killed himself. Uh, Stan? Yeah, Stan. Yeah. It's kind of the same feel. It's like the the director was like, Oh wait, I'm gonna steal from this story and just add it into it. Yeah, and it's interesting that it appears so late in the collection after we've had stories of mayhem and madness involving trucks and toys. It's a really interesting way to wrap up the collection. Are you just taunting me here already? Yes. Oh, yeah, we're or, jumping yeah. into it. Oh, yeah. fuckers. Oh. And then, of course, uh, we've got Quitter's Inc., which is an adaptation that we're going to be talking about, which stars James Woods and, and uh, yes. <laughs> And I'm of the opinion that that is the best and most transcendent of all of the short stories he ever did. I think that one stands up next to Shirley Jackson's The Lottery or Raymond Carver's Things We Talk About When We Talk About Love. It is that absolutely quintessential middle American, middle century short story. It's got a perfect arc, well-developed characters, and it goes places very, very quickly for a moment in time. I'm not a fan of the cat thing, though. That's that not even in soul. the... That's not even in the book. I know. It's like they just put in there as like just to have <laughs> the connection between all the stories because it's from the uh, anthology series, The Cat's Eye, and they just have to fuck with the cat. That pissed me off. Yep. <laughs> it really pissed me off. He was like, ooh, fried kitty. How about I fucking rip your dick off and shove it down your throat, motherfucker? Anyway, and the other one would be in The Woman in the Room, and that, that story wasn't too bad. I got to uh, give or take that one. You know, you get that with the collection. You know, you got ones that are good. You got ones that are just bad, and you got ones that are like, well, I didn't hate reading that, you know? So... Children of the Corn fucking was in Night Shift, and that movie was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there's a reason it spawned so many sequels. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, fuck it, Which, um, advisory, <sighs> just watch the first one. There's no reason to watch anything after the first one. Oh, no, one. but uh, the, we will have a killer filler on the remake. Okay. That came out in, like, 09. I'm talking about the fucking sequels. Mm. I mean, I lost count of that shit. There's, I what, mean, 10? Wow, an incredible Eight, number. Nine, so it's, it, it's a lot. How the fuck? <laughs> who is who is asking for this? Like who? Where oh, is the money coming oh, in we'll, to keep making we'll, these movies? We'll get to a couple movies that I <laughs> on our list tonight that I was like they well, made yeah, more than you, one. I told you they had a sequels, and I was like, "There's two. And you 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 look like you just been told like yeah. I don't know. But we'll we'll you, get to those, but there's some more in this list. I'm just like, what. Who, who the fuck budgeted? And one of them kills me who stars in a sequel. Yeah, we'll yeah, get to there's that. that. So I guess the big difference, Roger, between Church of the Corn would be, like I said, for me, I think it's the ending. Yeah, the ending and the focus on the interiority of the characters, because the dynamic matters a lot in the short story. Mm -hmm. It does not matter at all in the movie, um, because frankly... The film adaptation wisely realizes that the stars here are the children and their cult and the monstrous roles each of them plays. Yeah, I mean, 
you're, you're making a fucking horror movie about a bunch of kill, kids who killed all the adults in the fucking town. I don't give a fuck about your marriage spat. No, Just saying. And Stephen King wrote the first draft of the screenplay, which led to a rift between him and the studio. Uh, his draft apparently is just talking for two hours almost with a little bit of creepiness in the background. Ooh, that, that's fun. Hey, hey, girlfriend, let's go watch other people argue on screen. No, fuck that noise. Oh, and this, but this had a, I, I believe it was. See, it was just a little too early because what was the, what was the uh, movie with uh, Charlotte? Uh, Scarlett Johansson and uh, fucking Kylo Ren. Oh, that was a good movie. Yeah, but all that movie is <laughs> them fighting for two hours. <laughs> Steve King was just a little okay. behind the time. Yeah. Like, I think that was a little different. There was fight. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> a little different. I'm just saying, all that movie is is them fucking fighting. <laughs> yeah. You know, he just he. That's a little different. It's just though. not set in a cornfield. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say though, uh, this one did star Linda Hamilton. Yes, and I believe this was post. Is it Terminator? Post? Terminator was eighty four. I can't remember. I think this is pre. Is it pre? Okay. Yeah. I think it's right before. I mean, okay. I think it's right when she started because she was in that Beauty and the Beast show. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure this was a kind of her first like jump into like so a. She was in Beauty and the Beast with Linda Hamilton. I mean, not Linda, uh, Ron Perlman, right? Ron Perlman, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, where they barely had to do any makeup. Yeah, like, <laughs> just put some, some stuff on my face because I already look like a fucking <laughs> beast. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, actually, we'll probably I'm probably going to rate this outside of. Oh, uh, it's going to be in the top of best adaptations out of this collection. Actually, better than That's the short not, story. Yeah, looking at the list, I don't know if it's that hard. I mean, uh, no, well, I mean, uh, 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 yeah. you've watched Cat's Eye, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That cheats, though. It's an anthology, in my opinion. Whatever, dude. Yeah, Children of the Corn is a can't miss for any fans of horror cinema. The uh, first two thirds of the movie are just fantastic, full of suspense, full of dread. I know people knock the child actors and some of their ridiculous accents, but the setting is just phenomenally good. A rundown middle American cornfield town. The diner sequence is fantastic. The yeah. abandoned Main Street. Yeah, the the the, the adults being taken out scene is well. They add yeah. this like almost like Omen esque score. Where it's like yep. this Latin, you're like, this is in the middle of fucking nowhere, Maine. What the fuck are they? Who's singing? No, me, no, no, no. Who the fuck's singing? <laughs> <laughs> it just added, but it added a whole other element to that scene. Yeah, it's a know? masterclass in building suspense and tension. It's really, really good at that. And uh, the next one, and this was a made for TV one, but I, I'm going to go with Sometimes They Come Back. That one I remember, I remember when that aired. Fuck, I'm old. Yeah. Was that? <laughs> Well, I can't remember what what channel that was on. Was it, well, there was one channel at a certain point that got all the made for TV Stephen King films. It was like that was a channel. I know AB, like ABC, ABC or... did the stand and did like Tommy Knockers and a couple and of Langoliers them. too, didn't they? Yeah, but yeah. I don't know when that came out if that was still them or not. <sighs> this was well, this was before all that. As soon as they came back was before Langoliers, Tommy Knockers, and the Stand. So I'm pretty sure it was before the Stand. But yeah, I mean, it's a solid made for TV adaptation. Um, they don't really deter much at all from the story. And again, it's maybe TV, so it's not super bloody, but the makeup effects were kind of cool. I dug like when they turn to their demon selves. It was, I thought it was really rad makeup. Yeah. You know, and that's, I mean, that's really all it's really got going for it. Suspense and then that. But it's a good adaptation. I mean, you got the dude from Animal House. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and one of the Dillons. Is in one this. of the Dillons. Which Dylan? Oh, uh, is the isn't there isn't there a Dylan that plays like the head guy? No, that I can't recall. I will say the short story is well worth checking out as well. It's among the better ones in the collection, yeah. and it features sort of a proto Stephen King antagonist, which is like rockabilly greaser shitbag teenagers. He mm -hmm. would later That's use them to go great to. effect. Oh, yeah. he loves yeah. them. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, Ace Merrill. Hello. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but but no, you're right. Uh, this one is actually a better story than a movie. A, because you couldn't use King's colorful language in a made-for-TV film, which really takes away from yeah. just the disdain for these teenagers that are coming back, right? I mean, mm -hmm. really, it does. So I would I would definitely recommend reading this. Watch the film if you want, but definitely recommend reading the short story. Yeah, and it has too brutal of an ending in the short story to actually convey on a made-for-TV film. That is true, too. Now, this one's a little slack because it only, I believe, has two sequels. That came out. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So already what we got Children of the Cord still winning it with ten sequels. Ugh. Like goddamn. Yeah, this is fucking bullshit. But are any of these sequels essential to Sometimes They Come Back? Because I know there's what Sometimes They Come Back again. Yeah, yeah. And and sometimes they come back 
Four more. Four yeah. more, yeah. I mean, you yeah. can play with that title, get as many sequels yeah. as you want. I mean, like, sometimes they come back. I have not watched either of those. either. I just, nope, no, I'm, I'm good. No. I'm good. No, on the most of the stuff on the list here, I don't think I've seen any. I've seen part of one remake, and I wanted to pun, I wanted to tear my eyes out in that, but most of it is well, no, OG. Watched, we watched the entire remake of one of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. Well, the se- I guess sequel more than anything else. There you else. go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the sequels of it. Just the remake of one of them. So, yeah, there's one that you uh, didn't even know had a sequel. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, you want to talk about uh, no. two sequels. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, this is one I remember watching way back in the fucking day. and yeah, I 95 when it came out. 95, yeah. and for research, I watched it recently. And yeah, yeah. Holy fuck, man. The, this... It's it's awful, but it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of amazing. It's, it is terrible. It's it's awful, but it's also kind of amazing. Yeah. And the fact that like a lot of these movies, you don't have big actors or big directors. This one is definitely the exception. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And we're talking about yeah, right. the Mangler. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like literally. Robert England. Robert England. Fucking uh, <laughs> Ted Levine. Toby Hooper. I mean, directed like, and was a writer. And the uh, who, uh, actually, um, one of the uh, that other guy, the brother-in-law, was somebody too. I, I forget, but I, I I know his face, but I can't remember the actor's name. But he's been in some stuff too. On paper, this should be the coolest horror movie ever made. Of what went yeah. wrong? And Robert England's performance was great. Oh I'll no, give... <laughs> you can tell he was having a fucking ball. Because if you're like, if you're like, ah, I like Freddy Krueger, but he's not so he's not enough over the top. Robert Inglis said, all right, because I never thought this could happen, but the dude he plays in the fucking Mangler, more over the top than fucking Freddy Krueger. Yep. He's dancing. He's fucking hitting on, like, teenage <laughs> girls. He's <laughs> got, it's, what the fuck is going on? His dancing was a jig in a circle. Yeah, where he went around the circles. I'm going to do a jig. <laughs> it's so fucking ridiculous. And again, I want to talk amazing. to you about that fucking movie. Just like, dude. How, well, like, yeah, a maybe. Yeah, how how much fun was I that? I want to cosplay as that character and get his autograph and be like, "What are you doing, man?" And just be like, "I love the Mangler so much. I want to creep him out. Do something. How about I give you a little dance? And then you just dance for him. Yeah, <laughs> I want to creep him out and be like, "No, no, no, no. I don't want you to remember that and a fan of the opera. Please don't remember those two movies that I did. Oh, okay? Man, yeah, bad. yeah. I forgot about fan of the opera. Oh, but mm. goddamn, the Mangler's got some." All right, for one thing, they treat the main characters like the, everybody's just dumb. Just Because ca- your first introduction <laughs> to the first death, in the movie at least, mm-hmm. is this worker who drops her antacids right where the rollers go. Now, look, I don't know if in 95 there was an antacid shortage. <laughs> and, no, and no, no, because the price there was, there of antacid. Whole, there was a whole bottle in her purse when they find her purse in the morgue, so she literally had to go to her purse. To get more, because like they always had to go to a person. She drops a bunch more. of antacids. It was four. Which it was four. I've gotten antacids. I'm pretty sure they're like four. two bucks or whatever. But they're rolling on there, and this very dangerous part of the machine. She goes, "I got to get them." And she, yeah, surprise, Again. surprise, she fucking dies they trying were in her to purse. retrieve an antacid. They were in her fuck because like he goes to the morgue to the point, and he just like pulls her purse out. And it's a whole bottle. This is where I'm not sure if I hated this movie or loved it because she's the first victim. Yeah. And they bring her out in a box. A bucket. <laughs> yeah, in a bucket. Like a bucket. And I they take swear. the bucket and they put it in the ambulance. I'm like, <laughs> you don't like, need an ambulance for that, man. There's like there's like blood dripping out of the ambulance. <laughs> and I'm just like, that is you you could use any van. You don't need to utilize emergency vehicle. Maybe to a water transport. sealed contraption would be nice. Not a cloth. It material. was so ridiculous. You have EMTs just carried a bucket into the ambulance of like it's there's nothing left of her. She's just mush. You're mm. not gonna put the mush back together. It folded her, man. Yeah, because it's it, the Mangler is a steam iron, industrial steam iron machine. How did it get power again? How did it become alive? <sighs> In the Stephen King short story, a virgin bleeds into it by accident. That's how the movie works too. Yeah, yeah. yeah she cuts herself and then flings her blood. But <laughs> they've been doing that for yeah. It, God. Right, right. But she cuts herself, and I know when I cut myself, I react with my hand going everywhere. Yeah. As she yeah. flings just a shitload of blood onto the machine. Where it gets a taste for blood, and then they're transporting a fridge. 
They're yeah, moving a help, fridge help me out, guys. Like, I don't know there's a the... possessed fridge, too. Yes, there is a possessed <laughs> fucking fridge. We're not making this up. He was a kid. No, the, in the short, the, uh, <laughs> the cop has the it short? explained to him. Yeah, yeah the fridge is in is. it as well. The cop has it explained to him that sometimes demons get into machines by a bunch of ways. And there's a fridge that eats cats and dogs in a landfill and then eventually eats a kid and then takes the arm off of like the guy who comes to dismantle it. It's bonkers. And they, <laughs> in the marriage of the fridge and the mangler, get together and create the most powerful thing mm-hmm. if you are in the building. Like, that's yes, the only, that's it. its yes. only downfall is, is you, it won't attack you, for most of the movie at least, it won't attack you. You have to be near it for it to kill you. That's yeah, its that's only downfall. Yeah. Yeah, it's a machine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not that funny. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and most of it is just like, Watching Ted Levine, I was pronouncing was pronounce his name right, right? Yeah. Just being a dick, which is funny. <laughs> that part oh, of the movie was funny. And, yeah, right? he loves beer and antacids. Like, it's He's fucking like, weird. Okay, and also, this entire fucking movie took place in one fucking night. <laughs> yeah. Like, who the fuck? Like, it like it literally is night after, like, the first, I don't know, 20 minutes of the movie. This is an hour and 40-some fucking minute movie, by the way. <laughs> first 20 minutes of the movie, then... He's going to like multiple places back and forth, well, and did, it's an entire night. No, he remember he goes to the demon machine expert, yeah, and talks to him because he's doing research on the lady that was murdered by the machine, right? I mm-hmm. mean, like he's doing his cop duties of investigating uh, the potential that machine was possessed and murdered the old lady. I, I know this sounds like I'm making this up. I don't. Again, I'm I'm asking you guys: Is this what was written in the short story? Yes. It was just written better. It was just better. Yeah. In every <laughs> it was way, written better. Yeah. The short story works because it's sort of a really grim take on like an Arthur Conan Doyle detective mystery for the first half, and then it's the inanimate object mayhem he does so well in Christine for the last half. But it doesn't take place in one night. It spaces it out through a time and place. Which would make yeah. more it makes sense. sense. Yeah. yeah. No, this movie literally takes place in one night. Now. The fuck? I know we're about to move on, but there's a scene. I just, if any of our listeners about watch it. cut in half with the, mach- the mangler just cuts brother well, in half. That was I'm just going to bring up a, 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 <laughs> where there are some actual good kills. blood kills yeah, here. Yeah, there are. But there's the most ridiculous scene, and I fucking love it. When our main dude fucking he through the entire movie he's got this trench coat on mm-hmm. and he's back to his back to the machine turns on grabs the back of his coat. Most people in the situation will go, "Oh man, sucks! I'm gonna lose the coat." He has such a devotion to the fucking coat. He's like, "Fuck this noise!" Pulls out his gun, shoots the coat to get it off the machine. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever seen it that like that. He loves that fucking coat. He has such devotion to it that he doesn't wear it in the very last scene of the movie. Yeah. When he goes to show up with the flowers. Well, yeah, now it's full of bullet holes. <laughs> yeah. I've never, seen somebody, honor, bitch. I've never seen somebody honor. try to shoot something, a coat off a coat. of something. You know how long it would take Does he do to that anyway? Like, he's at a door, like, it gets caught in there. He's like, fuck you, door. Bam. Like, <laughs> you know how long it would take? He didn't shoot it when he got stuck in his car door. When he got home, he was all pissed. He just he's probably out of bullets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I was you're lucky, most, door. Most you're lucky. Part of that fucking movie was just the what that the where the brother in law is spitting some Latin shit at the fucking mangler, and it's just like coming towards him. It's just so absurd. Oh, you it's mean when, it, when absurd. it comes to life, and then the one thing that you were safe from, it it changes and starts going after them. Yeah. That. Holy. fuck. Fuck, yeah, dude, that was a whole. I lot was like, of "This is stupid." You. Oh wait, whole lot of fuck you. And I was like, "All you have to do is just leave the building." And they go, "No, no." After a while, it's, it's now it's chasing now, see, you. We need to actually. I want a remake of this. This could have been done well. I feel like yeah. if they had leaned into it, it would have been done a lot better. Or if they just had a slight different take on all the characters, it would have been really well, really well done. Like, but we need someone to take this and like. Really, they made, we went from yeah, like you said, we went from more of like a Sherlock character in the story to a fucking dick. Yeah. <laughs> like Sherlock was a dick, but this guy's like does a he call people, dick. Does he yeah. call people numb nuts throughout the movie too? He's like like numb fucking numb nuts. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, I I am changing mid episode where I said this movie is all awful. I think it's actually awesome. I might have to watch it again. Just <laughs> it's so stupid. The book, is, the, this one, the short story is definitely better, and the whole ending was just so much more scary reading it. 
than the shit CGI they had at the at the oh at that time. Oh god! No. Wait, am I wrong, Mike? I mean, no, I feel like not at all. Reading the ending was actually horrifying in the story. Yeah, because Stephen King, in his short stories, it's generally about how the characters process what is unfolding before them, and you never get the full picture of the thing. It's just your mind is broken by the horror of a gigantic laundry press coming after you. You don't have to actually see the thing try to move. Which is also Lovecraftian. Lovecraft yeah. is really good at just describing the horror and how the person was going insane from the horror they were seeing. I don't need to see a fucking laundry press just crawling towards you. Yep. Like, I don't need to see that. It's I, funny I, that you bring up <laughs> Lovecraftian because, like, the next one, I'm cheating looking at your notes, mm. um, kind of, I feel like, hits that right on the fucking head. The adaptation does. The short story... <sighs> okay. But yeah, the adaptation, I would definitely say, would say leans really Lovecraftian. Oh, can we talk about this adaptation with a freaking, like, they just, someone just blew their load on fucking cameos? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Age of Barbeau, fucking Tobin Bell, fucking, uh, and the guy who played the dad was somebody, too. You, only, you don't get him as long, though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they just spent a lot of money on casting. Oh, yeah. This. But I, Yeah, who was the dad now? Yeah, I can't remember who the fucking dad was, but this, this one's pretty much shot for shot in comparison with the short story the same the only it changes the ending and the ending of this Ryze and I we were talking you can you can back me up on this was better the right the ending of the adaptation was better than in the book okay yes it absolutely is and should we say I don't know we say the name of the story oh gray matter yep. uh, season 1 episode <laughs> 1 first segment of creep show yep the very first thing they opened up with I, w- I was so happy to open up with a Stephen King episode I was like oh and it was directed by Nicotero Yep, so and that was I, I was about too. to throw that out there. That was yeah. the end going, nah, I'll try this out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's absolutely a home run adaptation of it. The production values are great. Uh, the acting teeters on the brink of campy uh, to serious, and the makeup and practical effects are phenomenally yeah, good. so good. The Please, first so good. season of Creep Show definitely has some really good highs. And some really low lows. There's a couple of segments. Yeah, that but season I could... two's got more of the mediocre to low. Yeah, I, that's true. I'm just saying. There's one episode. I was a little shocked, episode. like, because again, Great Matters is your first episode directed. What a by, fucking And it's a great story way to, to start the series. Yeah. Like, yep. what a story to pick. Like, of all the short stories that haven't been adapted by Stephen King, they went with Gray Matter. So, like, that blew my mind because I was, I was, what the fuck? Well, that's kind of the way I feel about the raft. Is, oh yeah, 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 is, yeah. You know that didn't make it till Creep Show too, and that is by far. That was in skele- That's the other one. Yeah, skeletons, and yeah. that by far is probably one of my favorite that uh, based on a, a short story of his. And it's not till Creep Show two, which did n- nowhere close to the business that no, or, God, our no, attention. No. The first one did. It didn't. Um, but yeah, that the ending was the only difference. Uh, the basically in the book is just like the dad runs out of the bathroom and he just is a gold gelatinous glob that's going to split in two. And he's just like, he's like crying as he's running away. I was like, yeah, what a bitch monster. Anyway, <laughs> this one, we get like a rage monster. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. A tentacled thing. Yeah, it's so sweet, dude. Oh, uh, which, which again, is kind of Lovecraftian where there was a storm. It's in like, it's a coastal That's what town. I'm it's just, it, it has just, that feel. It's it set up really well for just a monster. Oh, so good. Yeah, well done. That was well done. Oh, here we go. Here is probably one of my favorite adaptations of Stephen King of all time. Um, Actually, going both of them are from this film. Cat's Eye, Cat's Eye people, with a young Drew Barrymore. Now, I think it's post ET and it is post pre drug addicted Drew Barrymore. So it's post ET, but is it <laughs> pre or post Firestarter? I I want to say pre. I think she did this and then, and then Firestarter. Firestarter. Can we talk about the, all the cameos of Stephen King's shit in the intro? Yeah, the uh, opening supercut is fantastic. Right? You get to see a bunch of like classical villains from Stephen King yeah, all got, hanging out. Christine got rabied is in out it. Cujo, not yep, like Cujo. Cujo, but rabied out Cujo. Like no one's gonna notice this dog covered in like shit and vomit and blood running through suburbia, <laughs> 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 chasing after this cat. But yeah, we get Christine. Oh, and um, the license plate on Christine said something. It wasn't from. Oh, damn it! There was something in the license plate. I fucking forget now. There was something else, too. There's yeah, the like... whole opening is catnip to Stephen King fans. It's mm-hmm. basically the collected universe all together for the first time uh, and tied together with the story of a, of a cat that has a great personality. It is a cute cat, though. And then you get that showdown, cat versus troll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Which was only which was written for the, the movie. movie. Yeah. 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 Which was fun, though. It was funny. That was a, it was a cute segment. But Quitters, Inc., James Woods, only... Oh, no, the actor who played the guy who ran the crew, I know mm. him from something. The doctor? Yeah, well, not the doctor. Oh, the, yeah. the dude who fried the kitty cat, little fucker. 
<laughs> I know him from some other stuff. I think he was in some cop stuff. He has a cop voice from that time period. Like, yeah, I'll see. Nah, 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 you're in see. trouble, buddy. <laughs> but, I mean, if you want to quit smoking, like, I, dude, I know they talk, it's a statement on addiction and how, like, it's so hard, but if you, like, if someone, like, fucking threatened your kids, you found some dude in your house, that's the thing, like, as soon as I see boots in my house and hear the oomph, I'm shooting that fucking closet. There's no, like, like, there's no, like, uh, I'm waiting to, like, yeah, and walk away. Hmm, I'm not going to, like, hear someone oomph and I throw an umbrella in the closet and walk away. You're fucking dead. You're in my closet. Yeah, but Quitters Inc. wisely plays its cards uh, up front very quickly and lets you know that the smoking cessation program that the James Woods character is participating in is actually run by the New York City Mafia Five families. So you would be shooting a made man, and that's not going to end well for you. That's, well, they let you yeah. know that more in the book, not the, not, the, not the adaptation. The adaptation does point out that he was very successful in another line of business that was oh, less legal. Yeah, I kind of picked is, up that. That, that is was, true. Yeah. And the, dude, that, like, he almost the, fixed his collar when he's talking. You know, the time. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. I do a couple other things too. You know, yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's true. <laughs> I and work like, in, uh, you know, sanitation and uh, sanitation yep. construction. Yeah, sanitation and construction. Now, when they show the one dude running outside in front of his house in, in the in the film, and you see him running in loafers. It's like they, they, the fucking attack, the mobs are like, I'm not putting on fucking sneakers. I'm fucking on one of my loafers. I'm yeah, fucking... that's wise, guys. Yes. <laughs> now, but you're right. They do kind of give you some nods at that. So you don't want to shoot and kill a guy from the mafia. <laughs> that's probably not a good idea. Now, the adaptation on the ledge, there's one problem I have is that one of my favorite comedies of all time is fucking Airplane. So <laughs> taking Robert Hayes seriously it, the first time I ever saw it, it was very, very hard. But it was such a hard that movie. No, gave, no, that, dude, sh- I, that still I, gives I, me anxiety. Oh, dude, it still gives me anxiety. After seeing that, that, I remember I watched that when I was a kid because it would pop up on HBO. And dude, seeing pigeons, like you know, I'd go downtown or we go up to DC or something like that. And pigeons, I was like, pigeons freaked me the fuck out after that shit because you know, like I have that that, that that specific segment fucked with me with pigeons for a little while when I was a kid. I had a thing with heights and just like just being on something that's only like what was it? Eight inches, maybe. Yeah. Like on in in fucking loafers, slippers, no traction. Yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> and with an asshole madman trying to spook you off yeah, the ledge, the no water less. Water hose, dude. Yeah. 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 No fucking. So, all right. For those who don't know, the ledge. This is again. This is pretty much verbatim the short story. Uh, dudes sleeping with other dudes' wife because well, the, the 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 guy who his wife's the wife's cheating is a fucking asshole gambler, rich motherfucker. Disposable. He thinks everything is a disposable thing, but for some giant, reason, giant eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, but for some reason, when his wife is cheating on him, instead of just kicking to the curb, he feels the need to like actually give a fuck about that, even though he's disposable with everything else. I never understood that. Yeah, so it's sort of the classic tale as old as time of like the trophy wife bangs the tennis instructor and the old rich guy gets butt hurt. Literally uh, tennis instructor. And the <laughs> the butt hurt is a glorious revenge plot to force this guy out on the ledge. The deal is very very simple. If he makes it around the ledge, he gets to keep the fortune and the wife. If he doesn't, well, if he dies, he dies. Oh, God. So this is, so literally a good, I don't know. Actually, I feel like it's probably like 50% of the fucking short, uh, the adaptation segment was him walking around the fucking edge. Oh, God. It's just, yeah. It's, it's seriously, man. Like that shit, I, I rewatched that like a month ago and still anxiety. It's anxiety just, like a motherfucker. Fuck. <laughs> yeah, it preys on the perfect primal fear of heights, and mm. the short story spends a lot of time in him his grappling with his own mortality on the ledge, and in the film we get to see it. Every single step is full of tension. Is this going to be the one where he falls? Exactly. And we really get a little taste of uh, something we'll see future in uh, Creepshow. Wait, did Creepshow come out before Cat's Eye or did Cat's Eye come out? Creepshow came out before. Did it? Okay. Yep. So we saw that in Creepshow with uh, Leslie Nelson uh, skit where- Another- Someone associated with the airplane yeah, played but, a serious role. Holy fuck. But, but uh, we get the whole like where now he's in the same place he put the people in that he's killing. So at the end of you know the ledge, the fucking douche nozzle husband yep. is on the ledge. You know, when Leslie Nielsen's like, I can hold my breath for a long time. Well, and that's <laughs> kind of the way the husband in this is yeah, just, just like, like I, yeah, I can fucking walk. It's I fine. Can do that. Can walk around. I ain't a pussy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's see what happens, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one up. Oh, boy. So there's going to be two opinions on this film, and I understand one of them. Uh, We got The Lawnmower Man. Now, that original adaptation was fucking terrible. It's fucking horrible. All right. It's fucking terrible. Yeah. And it also spawned either one or at least one, but maybe two sequels. 
Yeah, uh, the sequel I know, starring the dude that was the center ple- place for Max Headroom mm-hmm. as the main dude in the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, he was in a bunch of other things. Actually, he was in The Stand as one of the uh, bad guys going to Vegas and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But yeah, like so already you downgraded your already C listing actor for the sequel. Yeah, I can I can't believe they made more than one sequel. I'm pretty sure there's three altogether. Oh man, I rewatching it. It is very nineties. Oh, Look totally. what we can do with the computer. <laughs> oh, did he? Right. Well, we have to put ourselves back into 1993 and the rise of the techno thriller. Jurassic Park was also the same time frame. And that was all what happens with virtual realities, operating systems, computers. The tech becomes the star. And Lawnmower Man is an attempt to do that. But see, here's what's funny is I can watch a movie like Tron and I go, I understand, Tron. Good Mm -hmm. job, Tron. (laughs) I watch Lawnmower Man. I'm like, this is fucking stupid. Like, it just doesn't work. And like, there's something about. I give the exception to movies like Tron, and I fucking get angry watching Lawnmower Man. I'm like, no, no. And that's really got paid all they had back then. Millions of dollars. That's all we had back then. I know. That, that's the thing. It's like, how do you get mad? That's all they had. That's I, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it is. <sighs> but if you look at how fast you just brought up Jurassic Park, yep. didn't come out that long after Lawnmower Man. Bring up Toy Story. You think, wait, you think you think Lawnmower Man got Spielberg money? Really? I'm not saying it had Spielberg money, but... Uh, uh, g- 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 that was a cutting-edge film because it was Spielberg. I'm just curious <laughs> if... Because it was... Like, that movie came out right before you had uh, ILM, like, really get to that point where Toy Story yeah, like was that. like 92 and... Yeah, was and I'm like, just yeah. saying, like, four. So yeah. it's one of those... I almost kind of wish they'd do a, re- a reboot of... I'll, I'll be down with, for a long run remake. I would be. with Yeah, with the effects now, because oh, fuck. It, it's unwatchable to me. That's what I'm saying. Even if they did the Mangler remake now, and they actually wanted to show you the fucking machine, yeah. at least the effects now would be a lot better. Like When I think of that movie, I think about the Simpsons episode, the Treehouse of Horrors, where Homer goes into the <laughs> void, mm. and then in, and he's like, wow, just standing here, I feel like I'm costing a shitload of money and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But like it, all those effects, that is Lawnmower Man. Yeah, and yeah. the Simpsons are like, we're making fun of this. And they based a movie off of those effects. They, they did. They they totally did. And I did, I've told both other panelists here that... Um, at, at this current time, on Tubi for free is the director's cut, which if anybody else is, remembers is listening, the original release was like 92 or 93 minutes. The director's cut is like two hours and 10 minutes. So they add in more from the story, and Rise can test this, where you see Job progress gradually, and there's a lot more story, a lot more uh, a lot more um, fracturing in uh, the doctor's, uh, who was played by Pierce Bronze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, no. Yeah, James Bond. Yeah, James Bond, James Bond. James Bond yeah. was the doctor. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know his his marriage is going to shit. So there's you see a lot more story, and the CGI isn't as pronounced because it's in that sh- in that much of a shorter film. That's like you. That's a lot of the film is the shitty CGI. So I think that's a big difference too. Now you get more of the kills. You get more of the he's getting powerful kind of thing. Yeah, because the uh, the Stephen King story is very much a body horror Cronenbergian thing, with mixed with a little bit of Frankenstein in its DNA. It's almost sweet and sad about two men basically watching each other get destroyed, the Doctor and his creation. That's true. That is and very true. It's a little sad because the main actor Jeff Fahey in there, like he's in all the Grindhouse movie, like the both. Yeah, movies. he's in a bunch. I mean, like. I watched Lost, and he popped up in that. You know, he's been in a couple westerns. Yeah, like, he's in yeah. stuff. And before that, he was in this movie called, um, I think, Body Parts and stuff like that. Body Parts was solid. I know, fucking solid. And so watching him, and I'm not gonna use the terminology that will get me in trouble, <laughs> but he goes full it, and <laughs> it's really that is another thing that makes this movie well, hard to watch. Can we say it? Oh. I, I'm <laughs> just gonna say, yeah, he 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 he's trying to. He went, he went full simple jack. He's trying to hit jack. it out of the park. He went full simple jack. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And it's so fucking distracting. It's God hilarious. Did. Come on, man. I, no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, the, the Stephen King story wisely doesn't veer into that. These uh, Night Shift stories are completely inappropriate by many modern standards in terms of the language and slurs that are used regularly. But at least that one, he's a fully formed human. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I will say that uh, as King changed... Oh, absolutely. I don't think he could write... Uh, I don't think he would use a lot of the language he uses in these at this point. Hmm. 
Maybe if it's to prove a point with a villain or something, well, but yeah, it no, wouldn't I mean, be nearly he, he as will, casual. He will use it. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be as casually utilized. No, but you know, this was also fifty fucking years ago, almost. Yeah, <laughs> almost fifty <laughs> fucking years ago. All right, but yeah, I definitely recommend rewatching it and at least check out the director's cut. Um, I, I hope these two will. I know Ryzen probably will, just because. Yeah, I'm intrigued now to see more of that relationship from the story fleshed out. And, and that's what I enjoyed more. And then the end came, and I was like, oh, fuck, fucking. And horrible head. It does have that one cool visual. I actually think the head is neat. That kind of flying Star Fox head thing that was on the video game cover. Yeah. I liked it as a kid. I think someone liked the video game, and that's yeah. why. Yeah. Uh, it's painful. <laughs> oh, oh, I well, would find my way out. The I, video game sucks, by the way. It's one of Square Enix's worst games. They had like released Final Fantasy and then Chrono Trigger right after that, and then this piece of shit. Yeah. Mm. Now, I will say as much as I just should talk the movie we're talking about, the next movie... Yeah, it makes you, Lawmore Man look like an like look like Academy Shawshank. Award. Yeah, it makes yeah, it look dude, like Shawshank. Fuck, right? This movie's fucking terrible. Because okay. the next movie up, this movie's fucking terrible. Okay, not just we're gonna throw this out. Not just based on a King's short story, but the man himself directed it oh, <laughs> with a whole lot of eight balls. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Stephen King had the arrogance to say that Stanley Kubrick and David Cronenberg didn't get his writing right. Brian De Palma didn't understand where he was coming from. These absolute masters of American cinema. So I can do better. Yeah. Oh, man. So if, if you ever get a chance, YouTube the teasers for before this movie came out. Yeah. He's talking mad shit. And you can tell, again, as it's very infamous now, he's coked out of his mind. And he's on like Good Morning America, be like, I'm just telling you, this is gonna probably be the greatest horror movie of all time. It's gonna be fucking awesome. It's gonna fucking blow you away. Like, and <laughs> it, yeah. But we are talking about fucking Max Overdrive. Oh god, who yeah, made he, who? All right. He, oh, shut up. Who made who? Yeah, yeah. who made you? Which ACDC now is just like, wait, that went to that movie. We mm. we wrote all these songs for it went. To, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Hey, you paid us. Whatever. That's probably the most infamous thing with Maximum Overdrive. And it's is besides, the, and it's and it's like lazy ACDC too. Yeah, he's famed for his benign charity and kindness on Twitter these days. But uh, yeah, he was a raging asshole. Um, I remember reading about the Children of the Corn promotion stuff, and uh, basically he savaged the director and screenwriter every chance he got. So it must have been so satisfying to see him fall flat on his face and put out a piece of shit movie. Yeah, seriously. Plus, fuck you, buddy. I think the budget Took probably tripled when, after the production, he was sued for almost killing a stuntman <laughs> because of the. I think it was the lawnmower scene, or there's a scene where a piece of metal shot out and blinded this motherfucker on the set, and he sued the fuck out of King and the production company. So whatever the budget was, yeah, they paid the fuck out. That dude never worked again and probably got paid the fuck out. All right, okay, now really. I'm going to have to ask this. Have both of y'all read the short story? Yes. Yes. Called, was it? Trucks. It Trucks, yeah. What causes the machines to come to life? It's unknown, but it's speculated that radiation or an explosion or something has happened because the phones are down, the power is going out. Okay, because so... Yeah. Okay, so... Because in the movie, again, I've watched the movie several times. I've watched Why? the... And Why? there's a comet that they say is what's causing this. But then you get to the end of the movie, and there's this whole thing that pops up that says they destroyed a Russian satellite, and then the comet's path was gone, and then things were back under... Or, no, a Russian satellite destroyed a UFO that was near Earth's atmosphere, and then the comet left and everything went back to normal. And I'm confused. Were those aliens also that controlled everything? It's at the very end of the maximum overdrive. No, okay. truck, no. Trucks so that's is a just King that just overrode. Radiation. Okay. Yeah. Trucks is essentially it's it's a very inessential Stephen King story, uh, but it works for what it is. Basically, a bunch of people thrust at a truck stop. All of a sudden, the vehicles come to life without them, and it's. We don't know what did it. It's just you're you're cut off in this truck stop, having to survive and fearing the end of humanity and becoming a slave to the machines. And I will say that this is much like the Mangler, much better story <laughs> than 
a fucking movie. Unfortunately, the short story doesn't have anyone getting hit in the nuts with a soda can, though. Damn it. <laughs> or being electrocuted by an arcade cabinet. No, or... that's not in there either. It's or, literally just a couple or, of semis. Or ATM calling someone an ass. I believe calling Stephen King an asshole, right? <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, like the remake, uh, dude getting killed with a truck. Oh, my God. Little, the little, little Tonka truck. The little Tonka truck. God damn it. <laughs> hey, fuck you. Fucking piece of shit. Yeah. Fuck that yeah. fucking and movie. And by the way, as much as we talk fuck. shit about Max Motorive, um, somebody said hold my beer and made a worse version of the Stephen King short story Ugh. in a movie that sticks with the title of the short story called Trucks. Yeah, um, it fucking fuck that If movie. you haven't heard this already, we covered it on one of the other podcasts, Beautiful Disaster, Low Down, Groot, and myself cover it. It's a fucking tire fire. Holy fuck it. shit. Fuck it in the face. Fuck it in the face hard. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, can we done? Are we done with Maximum Overdrive? I guess. God damn it. Who made it? All right. <clears throat> Shut the fuck <laughs> up. And that's not even like, like I said, it's not even like good ACDC. It's like basic ass. Eh, it's ACDC. better that it's not good ACDC. That's the whole thing. You know? <laughs> like, I'm glad fucking like Thunderstruck and shit like that's not in that movie because I can <laughs> disassociate it. Yeah. Who made who is the fucking dumbass song that I go, yeah, it's in that fucking terrible movie. All right. Yeah. Back in Black. Came out before Maximum Overdrive, so I don't can't blame it on that. Uh, all right, all right. Next up, we got what I think is a really good adaptation. Um, is we got Graveyard Shift. Graveyard Shift. It's not a great film. Not saying that, but I will say the short story starts like halfway into the movie. So what they built on it was kind of cool. Yeah, and the short story is wonderful. Um, it's an absolutely it's actually a short story. It's, it's very like, short. Very short. But it's also, it follows the perfect progression of suspense and tension, and then finally an absolutely batshit insane ending. Uh, and the setup is just brilliant. A college kid is working in a textile mill that's infested with rats. And over the 4th of July break, he and some of the other less fortunate workers have to go clean the basement. And the rats just keep getting bigger and bigger the deeper they go. Yeah, yeah. and they have, so they have a whole week to clean it. It shot down. It shut down, and he always and you know fucking Warwick, who's the foreman, uses the ploy like, hey, you know, for union guys, that means they get paid, and you don't you don't get paid. So you want to come in and make some money? Ah, oh, you dirty fucker, dirty fucker. So basically, uh, in the movie, they just add, they give you a little backstory, and so you get someone dying, and then you get some awesome performance from Brad Dourif. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was fucking spitting the whole time. He, oh god. He is amazing. He is fucking amazing in this movie. I love him so much. And then you get, I forget the actor who plays the main character, but he's a drifter who used to be a college boy, so they still have the term going through the rest of the movie, college boy, which was a kind of, you know, a way to keep it in, because that's all he calls him in the fucking short story, right? Yep. But I'm going to tell you, the actor that played fucking Woolwork in the movie gets like the number one slot for fucking heaviest main accent, because that shit is on point. Uh, uh, did you, any of you guys rewatch Graveyard Shift? Yeah, you know, you know that was the dad from Monster Squad. No shit. Yep. What? <laughs> no way. And it's all the more incredible. Stephen King later mastered the main accent in his writing, and it's a staple of the stuff he published in the '90s and 2000s. But it doesn't even show up in the short story. Mm, no, it doesn't. But like, I guess because they thought it was set in Maine, like, fuck it, I'm gonna do a main accent, and it is heavy. Like, I'm like. Bravo! Because you hear people try to do it and they fuck it up, and it, or it's only in and out every once in a while. This dude was like consistently fucking heavy main accent. I was like, I like it. I like it. I mean, when I think of main accent in, in King movies, I always go straight for Pet Cemetery. Yeah, and it's heavier like, than that. Yeah, it's like, I mean... It's heavier than Fred Gwynn. Yeah, I, guess, I don't know. Yeah. That, that To me, that's the perfect example right there, but... So, no, the Great Rush was solid. Oh, I love how they built on the monster because in the short story yeah the, the rats keep getting bigger and bigger then they go into the fourth level yeah like they do in the movie and they're bigger and bigger and then they find one giant rat with no legs or anything uh. so it can't move in the story but in the movie now it's like a hybrid bat rat which is fucking worse it's way worse yeah the hybrid bats are in the short story too but they don't combine with the final big bat in no the no short. the yeah. hybrid bats are there yeah but i mean like they they did they made like the final monster had they, the rats and bats had bred and they created this giant bat rat hybrid thing i'll say one thing that's kind of effective with this movie and i don't know why it is but everybody's sweaty and dirty and I, I, when I watch that movie, like it's very effective. Like everybody just feels looks gross. They talk and about I, the heat in the movie, but you, but you know yeah. what I'm talking about, like in the just, story. And yeah. I think it's just like where where, where they're working and every character. And I like I, after watching the movie, you feel like you just want to take a shower 
because you don't see the characters do that in the movie. So you're like, I got to take a shower, man. I, I, I know I'm not sweating, but God damn. It's gross. Yeah. It's fucking gross. And like, 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 the, like and especially when they're eating, when they're taking the lunch break in the movie, and like their hands are black. And it's, like, sticky, not, uh, it's like white bread, so yeah. it's just like black. Oh, God. Oh. Yeah, oh. and this is among his grossest work uh, and plays with a super primal dread, the fear of rats, because the rats that they start finding in the basement are very bitey. And very big. And big. Like, before the final reveal, I mean, they're, they're talking about rats the size of fucking puppies. Ugh. That's a fucking big rat. I've seen and, that shit. It's gross. In Philadelphia one time. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> and since it's Stephen King as a juvenile, basically they enjoy biting nipples and dicks. Of yeah. course. Yeah, that's their, their go-to. <laughs> yeah, like, that's a go-to. Well, what's dangling but, off this person? dangly bits. It's, <laughs> it's not good enough to just bite a guy's I foot. I need to let you on for a little bit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh... And they they don't so that's one thing the movie has trouble with is they don't I guess just because of the rats they could find they don't show the rats getting bigger, <laughs> well because it also doesn't matter so much because that since that one uh, in the movie the monster has legs and it utilizes its tail a lot and it's got wings it shows up all the way on the main floor like the first kill you know what I mean so <laughs> it's not like they ha- the rats the rats in the story are guiding the humans and pushing them towards the pit of shit and bone that the rat just lives in. For this, you got a rat that can move around everywhere and just fucking eats everything. Ah, oh, <laughs> it's a cool fucking monster though. Like, I was I was rewatching it because I hadn't watched that since I was like a fucking teenager. I really dig the monster design and the graph and the special effects in the in the film. Like, I got to give him props for that. Not highly rated, no, but it's a good it's, film. It's really nineties. That's uh, yeah. That's the other thing. It's I love Brad Dourif talking about his why he has an issue with fucking rats though, like the Viet Cong rats, <laughs> and like he's just going like. He is hilarious. I, I, he, he takes the movie for me. I wish they'd have kept him for more of the movie. Yeah. He was so good. All right. So, yeah, check out Graveyard Shift if you haven't. Also, read it. Like, you just need to read Night Shift if you haven't read it and you're a reader. Please read Night Shift. Last last one we got here. I feel like Raj is the only one that got a chance to watch this. Yeah, I had so. the absolute pleasure of catching Battleground recently and also rereading the story. Um, and this is, among Stephen King's dumber concepts, a hitman... <laughs> Uh, performs a contract on a beloved toy maker, and the uh, toy maker has a beyond the grave revenge, possibly from a gypsy curse in the short story, uh, in which uh, some toys that he's made come to life to attack the hitman. And the hitman returns to his high end condo because, of course, hitmen get millions of dollars and all the beautiful women in first class flights in this bizarre Stephen King alternate universe. Uh, and in the <laughs> television version of it, William Hurt plays this hitman. And uh, he has to do battle with a whole footlocker full of toy soldiers who are out to kill him. <laughs> Their little pistols wing shrapnel at him. They have flying helicopters where the blades will slice the skin on his face. And every so often, somebody shoots a fist sized explosive at him out of a bazooka or a mortar. That's um, so good. It is. It's so good. I need, I need, I'm, I'm bummed I haven't watched it because it's like. It sounds it fun. Sounds it amazing. sounds fucking yeah, it's, fun. It sounds so ridiculous. Like <laughs> it I, is. I and you like, said w- William Hurt is the yes. assassin. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know who William Hurt is, think Ross from the Marvel movies, yeah. MCU. He's General Ross. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he was acclaimed in a bunch of seventies roles too. Like he was a very, very respected actor once upon a time. He was, but I mean, yeah. like after a certain point, he kind of went. Eh. My go-to yeah, is yeah, the uh, the brother in History of Violence. Yes. Yes. Because he's so sadistic in he that. Is that the was fucking brother. Me, he had such his... a small scene, but it was so powerful. Like I want to kill you as a fucking kid. Like, yeah. yeah. God, that movie's so good. Anyway, I get it. it Back to Kim Cronenberg. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the effects are not great in the battleground as it is a television adaptation, but there are a couple of moving scenes of the wounded little toy soldiers trying to haul their buddies off the battlefield as he stomps them into plastic scraps. And uh, this has one of the better twist endings of anything he's ever written. Uh, basically, he uh, finds out after defeating the entire force of these things with guns that the last big bad in the box is a special surprise, a commando with a small scale thermonuclear device that detonates the penthouse and kills him. Nice. It's fucking sick, dude. <laughs> it's a I great watch ending. This shit. But like I said, like, so you watched it in some in like different segments, but I did find an entire where well, they put it together. And it was like 50 some minutes on, on, YouTube. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. I, I think I shared the link to the. Uh, to the thread for this, but I, mean, I, I, I still want to watch it going after this. That's like the only thing on this list I haven't watched. Yeah, I didn't that, even know they had adapted it because I didn't really, I, I think I was in a living situation where I didn't even have like a really network, even like basic antenna TV because this, 
Uh, Nightmares and Dreamscapes aired on ABC? TNT. TNT, TNT? yeah. yeah. So that was cable. So yeah. I, I did not have that at a certain point, I think, when this was airing. No, it was like the mid-2000s, and I was stunned to learn about this series because I had never heard of it before either until we started preparing this. So we need to go back and like just find what they adapted in that. Seriously. Yeah, yeah be fine. <laughs> I seen the problem. They might not be good. And so, that's before TNT got balls. After, like, I swear to God, every, every, every freaking network, cable television network after The Walking Dead grew balls. Yeah. Like, The Walking yeah. Dead set a standard. It's like, oh, we can do fucked up well, shit too? Um, cool. I'll give FX props because they kind of did a little before AMC. A little before. I'm talking about Sons for like. Anarchy, I'm talking about the violence. The, shield. the violence yeah. needed for King properties. That's yeah. true. But I'm, I'm talking just, about the violence. Okay, not, not, just, not the language, not like the adult just rating. I'm talking about like the gratuitous violence that Walking Dead brought. Yeah. The Shield, eh, it didn't get. It didn't start getting super violent. Until after The Walking Dead came out, and then they had to go on Lem's death, and they beat the dude to death with a chain. That was pretty fucking violent, but that was after The Walking Dead aired. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, like, I get what you mean, but like, yeah. even Breaking Bad. And we're debating even Breaking FX, Bad. FX and AMC, I think yeah, they're about like, the same. Yeah, like, <laughs> they, well, but, I, but in fairness, you are right. I will give credit to both networks for yeah. just saying, fuck you. Because you know? before that, yeah, I feel like it had it had to be HBO, yeah. Showtime, stuff like that to get now, away with some Now you're getting a show on USA. Yeah. Like, fuck. <laughs> but no, it's awesome. It's just that era of TNT was probably neutered as fuck is where I'm getting at. Well, the, the charm of the story is, is it doesn't need a lot of violence to work. It's just plastic getting mashed up, stepped on and shot and exploding and a guy getting cut. But so I'm wondering if they just used the name Nightmares and Dreamscapes but not all of them are King adaptations and his other short stories. And that way that that's why I like this. That's the only one that showed up or is it the only one that was adapted from night shift. Yeah. That's a possibility. Uh, the mystery Stephen King show. Uh, did yeah. anybody actually watch this thing when it was first on the air? He's had a couple where he had the hospital one, like Rose red or something that like didn't make it. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. That was like right before this. I feel like early two thousands. It was about, yeah. It was, it, was, oh, it was actually one called King hospital. King hospital. That's then right. There was one called Rose red. It was a mini series or something. that came like, uh, he he had like a didn't didn't they do a show based on uh, the Mr. Mercedes? The Mr. Mercedes still Sadie show is fantastic. Yeah. Is it still going it on? It ended. It had three seasons, and it is was each season a book. Uh sort of. Books. They they skew. It's books one and three basically. And it's, what about two? It's really really good. Two is sort of thrown into the mix of the seasons. Um, but I think it's an absolutely great show. I highly recommend it. The cast is terrific. The storytelling is just wonderful. And there's some veterans of 90s TV behind it. So it's okay. just absolutely great. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will check it out. Yeah. it's a, That one's available on streaming services now because it was on some network nobody had ever heard of. Dish You? What the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's right. right. It was on Dish You. Dish You. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I remember that. Oh, fuck. All right. Well, we're not going to dig too heavy into upcoming possible King stuff we got. So that's all you got. This is, we covered night, the adaptations of Night Shift. We covered what was missing. Oh, on a side note, um, The Mangler 2, just had to throw it there, uh, Lance Henderson is, stars in the sequel to that. That's what that's what pains me to know is that one of my you know actors is in all the Cameron properties and all the badass shit in the 80s, Pumpkinhead. Yeah, he's Near the, Dark. He's, yeah, near dark. Near dark. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's he's in the sequel to Mangler. <laughs> Who's in the Mangler Reborn? That was the third one. I don't know. Oh, fuck but... me. This is terrible. This this story does it, 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 does it deserve a remake? Possibly yes. Does it deserve sequels? Fuck no. No. Anyway, all right. So that's it for our Stephen King Night Shift adaptations episode. But that is not all. As usual, we always got a little nice little fun segment at the end of this. But before we get to that, we're going to talk about all the other sweet GUI shit like going to GUIPodcast dot com. And hitting up our Amazon link and going through Amazon and shopping like normal. Buy all your Halloween shit, buy all your spooky shit. Buy, every, buy, start early Christmas shopping. Just do it through our link. Yeah. Buy like every one of these that you want to on the DVD through our Amazon link because you can get all these. Start getting your costumes together. Yeah, get costumes together. Uh, Arrow video, uh, Arrow video released an awesome Children of the Corn, so you can check that out. Creep Show is released on Blu-ray. I mean, cat, I mean, cat, come on. You got a Scream Factory released the director's cut of Lawnmower Man. I talked about. You got all this shit. You can. We just talked about. We're just we're just giving you shit to buy. Giving yeah. you shit to buy. Cat's Eye is well worth owning. Cat's Eye is very very well worth owning. Yes, I have owned that you, for many you, years. You can just even see if Maximum Overdrive is on Blu-ray or uh, just stop, <laughs> just stop. No, I do not. Rec- I don't even give a fuck about. Wow, it. high def shittiness. I don't care <laughs> if we lose money. I don't want you to buy Maximum Overdrive unless you absolutely feel like you have to. 
And um, I mean, I own a copy. I paid you know a dollar for it on DVD. Exactly. On DVD and oh, the, exactly a dollar on and a I'm DVD. I'm missing that high def badness. So <laughs> stop <laughs> hurting me. Anyway, um, and then while you're also on GLPodcast.com, you go to the link right next to Amazon as T Public, and that's where all the fucking merchandise is for all the shows under the network, all the designs, all the awesomeness. You can get on every fucking thing you want, except for koozies. So make sure to check that out. They're going to be running a lot of sales from here to the end of the year. So please check them out every weekend, every couple of days. The so pop many, up. and there's so many new designs. I think that have just been added the last like couple of weeks. Right, well, some old designs and some new designs yep. are coming out. So check, just keep keep a constant check on that, and something new might pop up. And um, why on GIPodcast dot com? Please check out all the other shows on the network. There's something from everybody. It's all fucking baller ass content. So with that done, it is time for. Stump, the host. All right, so I am up by. Oh no, I am. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I am too closer to you now. I think you're only two ahead. Mm. I won the last two. I don't know about that. No, hold on, motherfucker, because you you lost a couple in a row. Mm. Hunter has sixteen. I have fourteen. Oh man, this could put you within one. So, Riser, you get to decide who goes first. Well, you won the last go around, right? Mm-hmm. I'm still behind though. Well, what, yeah, we're gonna try to. Uh, let's have you that. kick it off. All right, all right, all right. This 2011 3D movie follows some Tulane students in a freshwater lake full of sharks. Name it. Shark Night. Yeah. Yeah. Oh <laughs> man, oh. that's a dumb fucking movie. <laughs> It's oh, so bad. It's so bad. And, there, and I can't remember how they explain that the shark is in the freshwater besides, I think, um, science experiments or something. A jilted high school boyfriend released a bunch of them is what yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a jet ski scene and the shark jumps and <laughs> takes him out. Are you just trying I to find a movie theaters. as bad as Maximum Overdrive to talk about? No, I feel man. like that's what you were doing. It's fucking terrible. Yeah. And you know I love dumb animal attack movies and that movie's fucking <laughs> <the> stupid. <laughs> Again, that's another that's another movie where we talk about making a movie look like Shawshank. Yeah, that movie makes uh, Deep Blue Sea look like fucking Shawshank. It's all right, fucking all right. stupid. All right. All right. So Jordan Peele has become one of the recent kings of horror, but his sketch comedy partner Keegan Key made it to horror first. He made his debut in what 2013 horror comedy about a demonic child set in New Orleans? Demonic child set in New Orleans. Uh, 2013. Yep. Hmm. Oh. <sighs> It's rapid fire, but I'm trying to think. 2013, Demonic Child. I'll give you a hint. He plays a creepy neighbor. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. Is it Milo? No, it's Hell Baby. Hell Baby. Damn it. Ah, ah. Fucker. Sweet. All right, so back to you. This 1997 film with Sam Neill and Sigourney Weaver adapts a classical fairy tale into horror. What year again? 1997. Sam Neill, Sigourney Weaver. Fairy tale into horror? Yes. You know, I'm going to guess. Snow White. It is Snow White. Fuck. I, did, I think I remember the fucking DVD cover. That's about it. Yeah, it had it. a creepy, yeah. decaying, yeah, squirting weaver holding an apple to you. That was just me going, I remember yeah. some weird shit. Woo! That was close. Damn it. So, here for you. The Cusacks, John and Joan, appear in four combined Stephen King movies. Name just one of them. Uh, 1408? Yep. We also have A Good Marriage, Cell, and Stand By Me. I was Fuck about, Cell. I was about to say Fuck Stand cell. By Me. Fuck Cell. I like Cell. I think and it's a really fu- quality movie. Fuck that story. Fuck that fucking no, movie. I'm just kidding. It's God damn shit. it. It's fucking stupid. A good marriage. What he's trying to do. Dude, a good yeah. marriage is even worse. I haven't watched that yet. I yeah, we have a movie with John Cusack and, and Samuel Jackson, and it's released directly to there and not in theaters. That tells you right there. <laughs> yeah. Something's fucked up. Because, <laughs> uh, again, Shark Knight made it to theaters. The cell didn't even make the theaters. Fuck, I mean, That's how bad the cell is. I get what is. he was doing with the cell phone and the zombie thing. I get it. In the book, it works. In the movie, it fucked that movie. Anyway. All right. So he's got one. So this yep. is. Here you go. This 2000 movie suggests that Nosferatu features a real vampire. Shadow of the Vampire? Yes. God damn it. Oh, you got it. Ooh. Like, I don't. Even if I win, even if I win this one, you yeah. got three. Yeah. So. But let's give him one more. Just to... Why? It doesn't matter if I get it right. Because I might want to try to answer one more just for the you know, oh, shits and giggles. Dick. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Aaliyah's last appearance was as a monster in this 2002 Anne Rice Ooh, adaptation. Damned. Yeah. <laughs> I love the defeated right answer. 
Queen of the Damned. That was a me. shit movie too. It's so bad. <laughs> it's so I like bad. when the start sounds like Jonathan uh, Davis. John the Davis, from John Davis did the vocals. Yeah. By the way, anybody that ever heard Corn before, watching again the not Tom Cruise Lestat pretend to sing like Corn, that's an experience on its own where you're like, this oh. is fucking stupid. I, what, what's going on here? And then yeah. so bad. <laughs> so the whole soundtrack, they like Static X is on it, and it was just the bad movies. Placement. The movies bad. Then you have shit like that happen. The best part was seeing half naked Aaliyah. That was, yeah, she's that was, amazingly she's, good. That in was it. it. I'd like to say that movie doesn't exist, and her last movie was Romeo Must Die because that Jet Li, fuck yeah, was her a good and Jet fucking Lee movie. Fucking baller in yeah. that fucking shit. Yes, yeah, but no, she did that shit. Yeah, no, I, anyway. I, don't, I don't. I don't. That movie doesn't right. exist. So Hunter's back up to three. Mm, mm. So Could have made a one. Could have made oh, a one. So close. So close. Ooh. I was gonna say Shadow. I, I was gonna say Shadow Vampire. I did not know the first one, Shark Knight, but I did know Shadow of a Vampire. Yep. The movie's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> it's awesome. But That's it's the one where the first time I ever saw Norman Reedus, he said how Willem Dafoe had fucked with him. <laughs> and <laughs> while they were filming, Norman Reedus was going to his apartment in New York, and he heard someone yelling out, "Norman, Norman!" And he kept looking around, and he saw some old guy and somebody else. He's like, "Who the fuck?" And realized that it was Willem Dafoe still in the makeup from Shadow Vampire. Just walk around the streets of New York, and he's recognized him, and was just fucking with him. That's awesome. And that's amazing. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Roger, for being on again. Those are those are like I'm sorry. I think those are the most cohesive and best questions I feel like you brought. Thanks. Yeah, I tried to keep it uh, to the the yeah, world of film. I mean, yeah. I, I I know I won, but I, yeah, I like those questions. I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's been times we haven't liked the questions. So that's true. I know you're being cocky yeah. right now, but yeah. Yeah, you were mm-hmm. so close. I was. I can go a- back to asking about obscure Japanese horror no, videos no, no, if no, you yeah, want. No. Please don't. No, no. Please. <laughs> but no one wins. <laughs> and then we go to the trivia game for a tiebreaker yeah, of zero. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome. So, all right, everyone, hit us up at lowdownbrown.gmail.com. Let us know if you've read Night Shift and every story in it, or if you've seen most of the adaptations, or if you went back and decided to read those and check out these movies. We just want your feedback that. You know, you're digging the content that we're putting out because that was a lot of adaptations, Ooh. and there's so many more stories in there. Not all of them good, but it's it's a, the book itself is like 200 fucking 80 pages. It's not like it's a long read. No, like, it's like among his shorter. Yes, it is the shortest short story collection, I believe, with the most stories. If you do that math volume, yeah, you know, whatever. Anyway, so hit us up, and until we talk to you again, embrace the madness. In a world ravaged by movie studios that keep rehashing the same things, only one podcaster has the guts to make it even worse. Join Mike the Hobbit as he traverses the internet to bring you some of the best and worst ideas for reboots, remakes, and reimaginings of some of your favorite and least favorite TV and film properties. Ideas like a John Waters He-Man movie, Fantastic Four the Musical, and Aliens, done entirely with marionettes. What podcast would bring this evil upon the world? This is Smack My Pitch Up. Available anywhere you get your podcasts. My name is Amy Bogard. And I'm Mike the Hobbit. And we are the hosts of Deeply Upsetting, where we use our expertise to answer your most upsetting hypothetical quandaries, such as what non wigged animal deserves wings? And what body part deserves a secret mouth? Which cryptid is the worst roommate? These questions and more that plague you will be answered on Deeply Upsetting, available anywhere you get your podcasts and at GUIPodcast.com. Hey guys, Scotty Big Daddy Preston here, that's right, the Geek Father, asking you to join me here every other week with friends and family of the GUI Network as we go through all the trials and tribulations of being a geeky parent. So remember, join us or cry.